Robots, it seems, will soon be capable of doing anything. Are there any limits to where they can't be deployed? What sort of jobs will be left for people to do? Over the past several years, the relationship between companies and their workers has changed more in Japan than in any other industrialized nation. Traditionally, it was a matter of honor for companies to provide their workers with lifelong employment. These days, that is less often the case. For many Japanese, it is a matter of honor to actually have a job. They believe that if they can't contribute to society, they won't be recognized as a member of that society. That's one reason many Japanese put themselves under so much pressure at work. To demonstrate loyalty to the company, they spend much of their time at the office or factory. They forego vacations and they work when they're ill. There's even a Japanese word for literally working yourself to death, karoshi. But the government is already envisioning a new workforce. It's pushing ahead with the robotics revolution. Georg Lohr's job is to get Japanese businesses to invest in Germany. You could say that early on the concept of Industry 4.0 threw the Japanese into a state of shock. They saw something brand new coming towards them, and they really didn't understand it. They had no idea what the long-term effects would be. And that worry resulted in headlines like, who will the next winner be, the US, Germany or India? Now the situation is more relaxed, because over the past few years Japan has made a lot of progress in engineering, IT and other sectors. So I really don't think that the Japanese have much to worry about anymore. In many Japanese companies, robots now function as supervisors. The workers perform menial tasks that the robots haven't yet figured out how to do. Japanese businesses see Industry 4.0 merely as a marketing concept developed by their competitors in Europe. Yeah, Industry 4.0, it is very similar to our concept e-factory. So we, Mitsubishi Electric, has already pronounced our concept e-factory since 2003. And I believe that so we are now uh, most advanced position in this reality of this IT uh, production area. So there are a lot of uh, issues which we have to treat together with Germany and Japan. So for example, several global rules so, for example, the property of the data. Whose property is data, uh, this data is? This is a common issue, for example, or other security matters, or uh, other so, uh, interface area, how to connect uh, each other, and so on, so on. There are a lot of issues to, uh, to work together. Those issues include securing data properly and protecting it against cyber attacks and other kinds of digital intrusions. In the beginning, developments in the fourth industrial revolution could be protected by barbed wire fences and monitored by security cameras. Now, more and more businesses are using cloud technology to share data with their partners and to link machines and production facilities. Europe's largest secure facility for storing business data is located in Frankfurt. Security is essential for the success of digitization in general and Industry 4.0 in particular. And by that I mean physical security and logical security, where data are protected against digital attacks. 
für den Industriestandort Deutschland ist es essentiell. An industrial nation like Germany must expand its digital infrastructure and make it available. And that means the data has to be made available too. This is what a digital cloud looks like. Storage facilities full of racks and racks of computers. Germany has a good reputation for data security and company executives want to keep it that way. Germany's high energy costs are prompting companies to move to other countries and they're taking their digital intelligence capability with them. If we want Industry 4.0 to grow and thrive here, we've got to make sure that our digital infrastructure stays here. The future of one German region in particular depends on how politicians and businesses deal with Industry 4.0 and a similar concept called the Internet of Things. The Ruhr region was once the focal point of Germany's industrial might and one of Europe's most important economic zones. But over the course of just a few decades, all that disappeared. 20,000 people used to work in this factory. Then it was 10,000, then 5,000. In 2014, the last 3,500 workers were all let go. And it's not just the Opel car factories that have been hit hard. The official unemployment rate in the Ruhr region is 11%. Many of those who still have jobs can't live on what they earn. The region was once home to thriving mining and steel industries, but now people here are adapting to meet the challenge of Industry 4.0. Jana Regenbrecht has been confined to a wheelchair since suffering a riding accident. To exercise her leg muscles, she visits the local facility of Cyberdyne, a Japanese company that specializes in robotics and technology, including artificial intelligence. Gianna Regenbrecht's training partner is a robot that can read her thoughts. The exercises are designed to help strengthen her leg muscles. When I started this program, I couldn't move my legs at all. I couldn't even feel anything down there. But I've made huge progress here. I'm more physically independent now. I can get around better and do more things myself. I can take stuff out of my closet. That makes it all so much easier. I can put the wheelchair into my car by myself and then climb into the driver's seat. I can move around a lot better. The robot and I get along just fine. We're a good team. When the patient wants to take a step, her brain sends a message to the robot, which then assists her with movements she hasn't got the strength to perform herself. The system developed from the idea of transmitting nerve impulses to the robot to get it to perform specific tasks. This system has a lot of potential applications in the industrial sector. For example, we're testing a system that provides added back support. The auto industry, among others, has shown a lot of interest in this system because it could be used to help employees who have to work in positions that put strain on their backs. The system could also have military applications. In the U.S. right now, they're testing one that would allow personnel to move heavy objects across difficult terrain. It provides additional muscle strength, so people could carry heavy equipment like large caliber machine guns. But this technology is not intended specifically for military use. Our parent company in Japan has turned down all requests for military-related projects. Former SAP CEO Henning Kagerman is president of the German Academy of Science and Engineering. Kagerman often visits government offices in Berlin to lobby on behalf of Industry 
It's important for us to develop talking points and to present our case to the right politicians. We try to make productive recommendations and to build bridges between interested parties in various sectors of society. The initial discussions I had about Industry 4.0 with unions were difficult, but now they've decided that they want to play an active role. They know that technology is headed in new directions, and they want to make sure that it's headed in the right direction. And we're supporting that effort. So I believe that we have all the important players on board. We also recognized early on that many of the political parties were ready to listen to our recommendations. I made presentations to three of the parties, and they all seemed interested. These are topics that go beyond party politics. Of course, some politicians are going to be opposed to this, but I don't think there's much serious opposition anymore. Kagerman initiated an Industry 4.0 organization that brings together businesses, labor unions and government ministries. Johanna Vanka is the Federal Minister for Education and Research. She's also a big supporter of Industry 4.0, but understands people's reservations. I've seen unique interaction between people and machines in German laboratories and research institutes. That goes a long way toward reducing people's concerns about new technology, and we are concerned. Take mechanical engineers, for example. They've learned their profession and worked at it for years. Of course they're concerned about this industrial revolution. They're worried that in 10 or 15 years, their skills will no longer be required. And that could affect a lot of people. I don't believe we'll get to a point where robots will take over or become indistinguishable from humans. But it's essential that people be allowed to decide where and how this technology is going to be used. And that includes the technology that they have in their own homes. If they can do that, they won't be so worried about the future. But engineering professor Andreas Suska argues that the proponents of Industry 4.0 have not fully thought out the role that humans will play. There's a wide range of ideas about how Industry 4.0 will play out. These include keeping humans at the top of the value chain, with humans directing the machines, the flow of materials, and other people. But Industry 4.0 advocates see people as nothing more than a factor in production, an optional factor. Many of the supporters of Industry 4.0 are engineers by profession. The way they see it, the production process requires certain resources as it winds its way through the factory. These resources include both machines and people. And workers are going to have to get used to the fact that they'll no longer be taking orders from people, but from machines. How can anyone describe this situation as humans at the top of the value chain? The systems are configured so that they use incredibly detailed data to create new and increasingly intelligent technology. They can recognize patterns and set priorities. And one day, we'll no longer need people to conduct the orchestra. The orchestra will play all by itself. Das Orchester spielt von ganz alleine. Das ist eine Machtfrage. Technological development has always been about who's going to control things. 
Yvonne Hofstetter is managing director of a company that specializes in the intelligent evaluation of large quantities of data. This technology increases the potential for surveillance. You can't have one without the other. Surveillance can be used to determine how and why you want to do something digitally. Even a simple search engine can reveal that kind of information. When I make use of digital technology, I hand over a lot of control to those who have access to my data. They know why I'm using this technology, and they have the means to influence my decisions about whether I'm going to continue to use it. At this point, digitization is at an outmoded and relatively unregulated stage. But we are about to see the dawn of a new age, and we don't know how that will lead to alterations in people, in society. Right now, digitization is destroying everything that we are familiar with. Computers and digital information systems are not only changing how people live, they are changing people themselves and the relationship between man and machine. Digital technology that was designed as a means of communication, something that would connect people, has become itself a companion. Today, many people have got to the point where they confuse the digital world with the real world and reality with cyberspace. Artificial intelligence is blending with human intelligence to such an extent that one day there won't be much of a difference between computers and people. Researchers at the big IT companies say the question is not if that will happen, but when. This is the research laboratory of Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro. He's trying to break down the barriers between people and machines once and for all. Ishiguro is working to develop artificial intelligence so that it becomes indistinguishable from human intelligence. He's also trying to make robots look more human so that people will be less afraid of them. My copy, well, in the first contact, almost all people may think, you know, the android is myself. Internal mechanisms are totally different from humans, but uh, there is no way to check it, right? So in a daily situations, it's quite difficult to distinguish which is which. What is the fundamental difference in the human and the robot? Usually we consider you know, fresh bodies, right? And a biological body is the uh, most important difference, but it is not true because uh, even if the person is using a prosthetic arm and legs, so we, you know, we just accept the person as a human, right? So the fresh body is not the requirement as a human. Researchers at Ishiguro's laboratory are working to develop intelligent machines that can actually learn things and then react to situations just like people would. Here's their latest invention, an android robot that looks quite human. Of course, you know, once we create the Android, we can find some practical use of that. We can download the various softwares, and then you know, that we can use the robot for many purposes. It is not so difficult to implement the emotions. In the near future, you know, the robot may have a consciousness like a human. 
So if uh, you know, we can have more tight relationships with the robot, very similar to the human-human relationships, I'm very sure in the near future you know, that we're going to accept the uh, our robot as our partners, as our friends. <laughs> The question is uh, when we're going to have a robot society. I think uh, it happens within uh, three years and five years. Experts at the German Institute of Japanese Studies in Tokyo have been tracking these developments. Japan is facing a major demographic challenge, a reduction of workers and a reduction of consumers, but an appropriate standard of living still has to be provided to an aging population. That can be done by bringing in foreign workers or allowing more women to join the workforce or by increasing the use of robots. And at this point, it seems as though they've chosen the robot option. They believe that robots can most easily be integrated into the system and that most people have at least a neutral view of robots. There could be cultural reasons for all that. The Japanese believe that this is a pragmatic solution. Robots are cheaper to employ and can communicate better with others than perhaps a foreigner could. One Japanese religion, Shintoism, teaches that everything has a soul. So why shouldn't a robot? The question is, how should we integrate robotic technology and artificial intelligence into society? The increased use of robots and the enhancement of interaction between people and machines will require improvements in artificial intelligence. If things continue at the current pace, we may one day be able to have stimulating conversations with robots. Of course, we have to make sure that people don't become more isolated or lonely. But how do you define lonely? If I'm talking to a robot, will I feel lonely? Isn't it more important to consider how a person feels instead of what others might think? So people have to change the way they look at themselves. What actually makes someone human? How do you define communication and social life? I think people in Japan take a pragmatic approach to all this. Wolf Dieter Lukas is a senior official at the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Today he's talking to Siemens executives about Industry 4.0. We're discussing how politicians and business leaders can promote this concept. Lukas says the best way to overcome potential problems is to discuss them. Revolutions involve conflict. We want to discuss that and to find solutions now, so we don't have to fix things later. Herzlich willkommen beim Siemens. Welcome to Siemens and the meeting of our steering group. Before we start, I'd like to stress the pre-competitive nature of this meeting. Certain things are clear. All of us understand what roles are to be played by politicians and business executives. Businesses strive for economic success. Politicians are responsible for setting the conditions in which we can do that. We would not presume to make such decisions ourselves. But we want to discuss with our political representatives a framework for legislation and the possible effects of various legislative options. I'm open to flexibility and compromise. We cannot assume that things are going to stay as they are. They won't. 
We need new arrangements and fair working conditions, including a minimum wage. I want labor contracts that don't take advantage of the workers. I don't want to see more short-term employees and subcontractors. That's my basic position. People who disagree with that are not so much opposed to me or my ministry, but to our social welfare state. The global strategy consulting firm Roland Berger believes that digital conversion is not moving ahead fast enough. They say that European businesses must spend 1.3 trillion euros to achieve a breakthrough with Industry 4.0, otherwise Europe will lag behind the rest of the world. Here, Berger executives are talking to their colleagues in Paris about how France is dealing with these new concepts. We did a survey on about 800 uh, small uh, companies uh, in France to ask them uh, what were their position with regard to uh, new technologies. And the critical issue, uh, they, they refrain from uh, willing to invest in those new technologies because they have an uh, uncertain uh, context, uh, they don't have enough orders, <laughs> I would say, and uh, there is a kind of political environment which is not really favorable for investment. Industry 4.0 is also seen as automation, and uh, automation in France is uh, replacing uh, man. And uh, that's the reason why it's uh, always uh, constraints and a uh, very old debate uh, compared to replacing uh, machine by man, man, man by machine. And uh, this is uh, also a very strong control uh, issue uh, which we have, uh, especially in France, but you can see that in many other industrialized countries. So thanks, colleagues, for taking the time today. Max? The Berger consultants are familiar with the concerns raised by medium sized French companies. It's the big corporations in France and Germany that are setting the pace when it comes to the digital transition. And that's had a huge impact on the French middle class. At the Roland Berger offices in Paris, Hakim El Karoui has been analyzing the situation. But here it's a political topic, not an economic one. And it's dividing our society. His research indicates that over the next decade, 20% of all jobs will become automated. That's three million jobs in France alone. Today, French society is divided into three classes, the elite, the middle class, and the lower class. Hakim El Karoui says that technological development will create social distortions, which in turn will lead to social conflicts. Deindustrialization in France has created major disruptions in the labor force. A lot of people still have jobs, but the numbers are down. There are fewer workers in large businesses, and they're not as organized as they used to be. And this will continue as automation moves ahead. But wait until this starts hitting the middle class. With middle class, we mean people who've had a good education and have analytical skills. When they start losing their jobs, they're going to revolt. Today, the most important party in France is the National Front. Some of its supporters are racists, but most of their followers are young people who believe that they have no future or people in rural areas who say they're not benefiting from globalization. And they're upset that the government isn't listening to them. What's more, a lot of people in the banlieue don't have jobs, and they have no future, and they're angry. No one wants to see right-wing extremists come to power in Europe, so I think we have to pay close attention to all this. These demonstrators who've gathered at the Place de la République in Paris call their movement Stand Up at Night. They're upset about issues such as social inequality, corporate greed, drastic government spending cuts 
and the future of the labor market. Some people earn their income from investments. Those investments are based on the labor of others. But most people have to work for a living. And if their jobs are taken over by machines, they'll be out of luck. Il est remplacé par la machine, du coup l'emploi disparaît. Alors la question va se poser. How are you supposed to earn a living if you don't have a job? Society can respond to the situation in one of two ways. People can rise up against the system, or the government can impose a surtax on the profits generated by these new machines. Une autre possibilité, c'est de taxer la richesse créée par la machine qui remplace l'être humain. Technical advancements are supposed to benefit people. So workers whose jobs are replaced by new technology should share in the profits that are generated by that technology. These workers are entitled to compensation, but they're not getting it. When jobs are eliminated by automation, the company makes more money, the bosses get bonuses, and the shareholders get a dividend increase. The workers who've been replaced get nothing. More and more people are worried that this new industrial revolution is going to leave them behind. A lot of occupations are going to disappear. Even the supporters of Industry 4.0 agree on that. How should Germany respond to this situation? A Silicon Valley venture capitalist may have the answer. What is Germany's role going to be as a leader in the information age? As a percent of population, Germany actually has more STEM-trained engineers than America. So you have the talent of people who have the education to do the job. But there's a really different thing required in addition to that. As I look at the companies that are leading the Facebooks, the Googles, and the Amazons, I don't see any companies that are, if you will, created in Germany. And that's something that if I were a German politician or a German business leader, I'd think very deeply about. We have hundreds of companies here that fail, but we fail quickly. I've seen it happen again and again and again. It's Friday afternoon, it's the end of the month, there's a board meeting. The venture capitalists come in, the company has not been meeting its plan. The people say, this company is done, today. Now, German labor laws wouldn't let that happen. Over the weekend, a large number of those people are going to get called by other companies, and on Monday morning, most of them are going to have a choice of new jobs, probably very close to where they used to work. They may not even have to change their carpool. So it's that culture which says failure is okay, and experiment quickly and keep changing until you get it right. That is sort of the unique value of, of Silicon Valley. The Germans who really want to be entrepreneurs have left Germany and come to Silicon Valley. The same is true in France. Um, Hollande was here a year or so ago, and I don't remember the numbers, but he was questioning out loud why are there thousands of people working in Silicon Valley that are French citizens holding French passports? Why aren't they at home in France uh, working there? And it was the same issues. The French labor laws are even tougher than the American laws. Um, <clears throat> and I said in a bit of a joke, well, you know, entrepreneur is a French word, but that's where it stops. Experts from the German Labour Ministry have come to this conference to discuss the future of the workplace. Labour 4.0 versus Industry 
I think that companies like Google, Airbnb and Facebook believe that they no longer need the state or that the state interferes with their business. So they just ignore the agreements that they've made with the state. I think these actions are provocative. They run their businesses exactly as they want. They tell us essentially to deal with it, and they've got the financial assets to back up their position. I traveled to the U.S. last year to do some research on all of this. I got the impression that the executives at Google, Facebook and the rest have been reading Marx and Engels. They wrote that the continuous development of capitalist production will destroy everything that lies in its path. That's pretty much what these big technology companies are doing. There are a number of issues that involve working hours. We favor a situation where workers could choose their own hours. This would be open to negotiation between the workers and management. We've been talking to a lot of people over the past several months, and there seems to be quite a bit of support for this option. There are many different kinds of work. Regular employment, taking care of your family, doing something for society, and work as such. But digitalization is redefining the concept of work. It's no longer the case that a young person takes a job and works at the same company until he or she retires. These days, more and more people work at different jobs. And they have time between those jobs to set new priorities, acquire new skills, spend more time with the family, or just take a break and do something creative. So I think that we need, first of all, a universal system of social security, or citizens' insurance. And second, we need a basic income that's available to everyone. Green Party MP Wolfgang Schrengmann Kuhn says the Bundestag has not yet taken up the topic of a basic income. The idea of guaranteeing someone an income of 800 or 1,000 euros a month sounds rather silly at first. Do the math. 80 million people live in Germany, times 800 euros a month, times 12, that works out to about 800 billion euros. That sounds like a lot. When I talk to some of my Bundestag colleagues about it, they reject it out of hand. 800 billion is more than twice the size of the current federal budget. Strengmann Kuhn has come up with a proposal for financing a basic income for all German citizens. I'm an economist by profession, and I drafted a report on how we could provide everyone with a monthly income of 800 euros. We could do it by revising the tax rates, and they wouldn't be much different from the current rates. It's just a matter of reallocating financial resources. In June 2016, Switzerland held a referendum on whether to provide its citizens with a basic income. Was this a vote against the concept of work? Entrepreneur Daniel Henny is a co-founder of the Swiss basic income movement. I think work plays a central role in people's lives. It's the most natural thing in the world for people to determine how they're going to make a living. We're used to working and earning money. But I think that's going to change. It's not a matter of eliminating jobs. It's a case of getting away from the idea that work can only be defined as gainful employment. People in many different countries are discussing the concepts of basic income and Industry 4.0. And the question always comes up. Won't people become lazy if they no longer have to work for a living? 
Maybe it makes people lazy in the first moment because they are shocked that they are not forced to do what another says they have to do. We have this behavior to become lazy when there are no incentives. But that is a result of incentives that we think everything has to be incentived. This initiative is not about pumping more money into a running system. It's about this this term of the unconditionality, which is a new thing. It doesn't exist in society right now. So all we do is all available incomes that are already paid out today from Social Security, um, from uh, the place you work, from different fields, we say we have a level which is unconditional and that's the level you need to live, which is uh, here in Switzerland around 2,500. So all that changes is that people don't have more money after uh, the initiative would be approved but actually they have more power to decide what they actually want to do. In the Swiss referendum, 77% of voters rejected the proposal to create a basic income for everyone. But the fact remains that robots and computer algorithms have shaken the traditional concept of work to its very foundation. More and more businesses are bringing in machines to take over the jobs that used to be done by humans. Will the workplace cease to be a means of integrating people into society? The industrialized world continues its transition into a new era. What will the society of the future look like? What role will humans play in that society? And what will become of employment as we know it today? The time is coming when only one third of the population will be gainfully employed.